salutations, viewer. It is actually I, the boy. Um, with me today is you, listener. Uh, well, at least one of you. Um, I should mention, uh, my constant companion, Eric J. Chucky, is not with us today. Instead, in his glorious stead, I have been commissioned by one of you to talk about the WWE pay-per-view Fastlane. But before we get to any more of that, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That's important. More important is to hit the like button and to share the video with your friends. Also, Super Blizzard is a really, really awesome guy. I believe one of his songs is going to be supplying our theme music. That has yet to be determined because this is not the Two Nerds podcast. I believe the title we're working with is One Nerd and Some Other Guy. The other guy being uh, my friend Billy here. Billy, say hi to the nice listener. Hi, listeners. All right. Um, we're going to be covering Fastlane today because Billy demanded it. Uh, he said it was a travesty that we were not covering the WWE pay-per-view, and since White did not watch the WWE pay-per-view, he is not qualified. But we did watch the pay-per-view, so he is. So I, off- so he offered to put his money where his mouth is and help me cover the thing. Um, I mostly just like telling the boy that he's wrong. I. Which I feel is a great dynamic, because <laughs> mostly White just cowers in fear of me. See, he's not here, so I can say stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, first off, uh, overview, general stuff. Uh, Billy, what did you think of the pot? What did you think of the, um, the pay-per-view in general? Uh, I thought it was a good average. I thought it was a good build to Mania. Yeah, same. I thought it was, you know, Perfectly acceptable pay-per-view, but certainly pay-per-view quality. Um, nothing special, nothing that I'd write home about, nothing that I'm going to remember six months from now. Um, fair warning, listener, it's been a couple weeks, so there might be stuff bully or I forget, because it wasn't super memorable. Um, but since there isn't much to say about the thing in total, why don't we just get started with the matches. The first match is, uh, well, was a six-man tag, The Authority, uh, Seth Rollins, Kane, The Big Show, versus Dolph Ziggler, Ryback, and Eric Rowan. Now, I hadn't been watching... I hadn't even been watching WWE Week in Review going up into this pay-per-view from the previous pay-per-view. I didn't watch a single Raw, so I did not really catch any of the builds for this match. Billy, do you watch WWE Week to Week? I try to. I wasn't aware this was going to be on the card. That's a little indication they really gave of it. All right, well, that's not... That's not really... I was hoping for, like, oh, yeah, it was a really good build, but no, apparently it was not. Okay, well, I mean, that's not unexpected. It is the E. Um, it was... Well, I mean, it, it, it made sense in what all was going on, but they didn't really, like, build to, okay, we're going to have this match. It was more that the match was happening because these guys don't like each other for various reasons. Yeah, and and they kind of had to shoehorn Rollins onto the card, I would think. Oh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's basically one of your top heels at this point. You probably want him somewhere on the card. Yeah. Um, it was a match. It, uh, that sounds really redundant, because the match <laughs> itself was kind of redundant. It, I mean, Rollins was good. Ziggler was good. Ryback was, you know... As good as he ever is, Rowan actually had a decent showing in the middle of the match. He did, like, he sold really well. The injury, I think it was to his leg. He hit a turnbuckle, he hit one of the turnbuckles on the outside to one of his legs, and he sold that pretty well throughout the match. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have anything you noticed in, like, in total about the match? Anything, any spot that stood out to you? Because I know you watched it again more recently to try and refresh your memory. Actually, I forgot to do that, but... But no, the only thing I really remember was the Rowan's been kicking the post spot. Really, Rowan's been a lot better on his own than I would have expected out of him. I think we were all kind of expecting him to be the Wyatt family member to fade into obscurity quickly. <laughs> yeah, Luke Harbour definitely, you could tell even in the family, he was a breakout star waiting to happen. He has a lot of talent, a lot of charisma. And, of course, there's Bray, but you're right... Rowan always sort of faded into the background, despite, you know, really being a very talented big wrestler, having a really great look, and as White is so fond of pointing out, he has apparently the juiciest booty in wrestling. Um, (laughs) But AI didn't, I didn't expect much from the guy either, and he's been a surprise. He's doing pretty well with what is, I mean, pretty and arguably a shitty gimmick. 
Yeah. Um, really, I'm getting kind of tired of the uh, Ziggler, Rowan, Ryback group. It's it, it feels like they just don't have anything else for them, you know. There, these are there's uh, these are three guys who need to work with somebody, and they need to be on the card. We yeah. this is a match for them to be in. It's um eventually uh, the authority goes over from a uh, outside the ring knockout punch from the Big Show, which like. Looked good at the time, but they really should not have played it back in slow motion. Um, cause it looked really good, really impactful. Like he, like he slugged the guy on, you know, I think it was, yeah, he slugged Jig- Ziggler in the, in the jaw, but then when they replayed it in slow motion, his fist wasn't even entirely closed. <laughs> he just sort oh, of yeah. ham hocked at him. I think I remember him. that. He just sort of ham hocked at him and it looked really silly. Um, the, the spot looked good, it just could not bear up under slow mo. Um, other than that, it was, I mean, it was, like I said, it was a match. Um, nothing really much, oh, uh, after the match, though, that was interesting. Um, yes. After the match, the authorities getting ready to do the murdering of these three guys, I, what I have to assume is for the millionth time, being as that's yeah. just generally how they work, and Randy Orton's music hits, that's really cool. Um, he comes oh, back, yeah. clears the ring. Um, what did you think about Orton's comeback? What did you think, did he, did he, I mean, the crowd popped for him pretty loud, I thought. What about you? I, I was definitely surprised. I, I guess maybe I kept expecting him to come back, like, every pay-per-view since he was gone, but I had finally kind of written him out of my mind, so I was, I was surprised by it. You think they waited, like, just long enough that you forgot Randy Orton, so that when Orton came back, it was a big shock? Yeah, because, I mean, I was expecting it at the St. Louis Survivor Series, which is his hometown. Yeah, oh, that'd be a long absence for him, though, because he wasn't injured or anything. He was just out to film a movie, which was done filming, like, a month or so ago. He could have been back sooner. Yeah. Um, he may have just wanted some time off. I mean, if the WWE should have learned anything by now, it's that time off is important for your talent. Yeah. Especially your top tier guys who you want to keep around for a long time, and Randy Orton has really become one of those guys. Um, I, I was really kind of surprised the crowd was as into him because the the crowd seems to be kind of turning on the old guard and wanting just the new. So it was kind of nice to see them not shit all over the old guard for once. Yeah, it was nice because. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it very easily could have been another Batista thing, where, you know, he comes back as a face, yay, he's back, and then the crowd boos on him because all they want to see is Daniel Bryan win every match. Um, well, and see, that's what I was was worrying about with the Rumble. I was afraid they were going to have him come back and win there. Oh, oh, <laughs> that would have been a bad idea. Almost as bad as, it. I mean, turns out Roman Reigns winning was, at least that night, that guy got booed out of the building. Oh, yeah, I, I still don't fucking understand that. They want new, they want new, they want new, they get new. Boo, it's not the new we want. Um, well, I mean... Look, there's a very bitter part of me that really honestly believes it's just they were... They were salty, their precious baby Daniel Bryan didn't win. But, and also that crowd, that crowd is just hostile in that town. It's just yeah. hostile. But... Well, and that, it, it might not be that bad if the WWE had the fucking foresight to understand they don't rule the Philly Pittsburgh area. That is still ECW territory. Like, they, you, they, they always walk in there and think we can do the same thing and then are like crapping their pants when the same thing doesn't work there. Uh, yeah, and despite the fact that you own ECW, the Philly fans don't like you. They'll never... I, honestly, if I was Vince, I'd stop fucking going to Philly. Like, just stop going there. If the fans don't want you there, and they clearly don't, sure, you can make money on the sales, but it makes your product look shitty. It makes you look like you don't know what you're doing when you get nothing but booze from an audience. Stop fucking going to Philly. I, I don't even know that it's necessarily that... Well, I mean, I'm sure they don't like the WWE, but if they're going to Philly or Pittsburgh... They need to 
make efforts to make it a show Philly and Pittsburgh would like. If they had had Bryant win the Rumble, everything else would have been forgotten. That would have been great. But oh yeah, the fans the fans would have loved it. They would have exploded. The roof would have come off. But mm-hmm. uh, you're right. If you're gonna if you're gonna go to Philly for the Rumble, you need to pick a you need to pick a finish Philly's gonna like. Otherwise, you're gonna get fucking loud booze. Yeah, unless the point of the match is to kind of show the crowd's not into something like Cena versus Orton. Or if the point, like if a heel is going over, there, you could, I mean, use Philly's tendencies against them. If they're going to boo anyone but Daniel Bryan, have a heel go over. Then the boos sound like that heel is just monster over. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, no, this is just, it was just bad planning. But um, as far as this pay-per-view goes, this match was, uh, the, the, the six-man tag was, I mean, forgettable but good. I think that's probably going to be the watchword of this whole show, forgettable but good. Uh, aside from, like, two or three spots and a cu- and the top two matches on the card I really liked, but I'll, I will get to them when we get to them. Um, nothing, after Orton cleared the ring, nothing much really happened. I know some stuff's gone on on Raw since then, like Orton's playing a long game, pretending to rejoin the Authority, that way he can, that way he can kill Rollins when it suits him, mm-hmm. but... I don't know. Uh, I don't actually watch it. I watch Week in Review now, which is like 20 minutes of my time to keep up on storylines because I don't really care about your product, your wrestling product because it's kind of inferior to your minor league, which is sad. Um, <laughs> I watch NXT. But, yeah. uh, the next match was... Uh, Do you have any, any last thoughts about that match, first off? Mm, not that I can think of. Cool. Uh, the next match was Goldust versus Stardust. I gather this had been built throughout the pay-per-view cycle. They broke up. Uh, apparently there was some mix-ups. Uh, you said you kind of watch week-to-week. Did they do any better building this? Uh, they did They did some things, but it was kind of low-key. Like, Goldust called him Cody at one point, and Stardust snapped at that. Stardust was doing the stereotypical walking off during tag matches after they lost one. Okay, so they there was a build there, but it wasn't anything special. Uh, all right. Yes. Uh, at the very least, the match had a good story to it. Um, yeah. The, I, the, there was a Dusty Rhodes uh, Gold Dust promo on it uh, before the match that went on just a hair too long. Uh, it was good, uh-huh. but the last thing Dusty did was a little, like, just repeating himself. Not the best. Um... Set up the story of the match was that Goldust wanted to beat Stardust so that he could, you know, try and get Cody out of his schizophrenic break. Because beating up a guy is just a great way to do that. Um, <laughs> and oh, wrestling! You don't understand psychology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he didn't want to hurt him. He wanted to just just win the match. That way, he, you know, that way Stardust would see that it was I don't know that he could lose and thus wasn't Stardust. I, it was a weird, confused thing, but you, but it made sense in wrestling. Like, oh yeah, so if he wins, he's not Stardust anymore. That's how wrestling works. Um, that is uh, one of those odd story points that wrestling fans, we just don't question. Yeah, we don't. It, yeah, it makes sense. Of course, if Goldust wins, Stardust isn't Stardust anymore. But why? Shut up, is why. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I think they, I think the wrestlers did really well to sell that gimmick, especially Stardust. Uh, Goldust, I mean, he's been on top of his game for the last few years. He's as good as he ever has been. But Star, uh, but you know, Stardust did a really good job selling the story of the match in that he was every time the fans would chant Cody, he would like stop what he was doing and act like he was giving him a headache, and he really interacted with the audience. And the audience loves to be interacted with. It's why Yes got over. It's why. Fandango's music was the most over part of the entire gimmick. The audience loves to interact with the show. So when they can chant Cody, 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 and Stardust begins flipping the fuck out in the ring, that's really cool for them. And I think it was a really cool, you know, match moment. Um, what about, um, how do you think the wrestling itself was? Because I thought it was a little, I thought it was a little low key, like purposefully so, but still not, not super overwhelming. Yeah. That's more or less my take on it. It More or less, I felt going into this match, this was just kind of a stopping point 
before they got to Mania to do, like, round two. And that seems to be what they've done so far. Yeah, yeah, that, this felt very much like the, like a build-off match for, for a, for a rubber match, you know, at Mania itself. But, uh, it, eventually Goldust goes over on a roll-up, like, a, a crucifix roll-up, specifically. And Cody shakes his hand, like, okay, yeah, you win. And then rolls out of the ring, so it, everything's just sort of resolved. Um, I feel like I should be going over the match more, because it wasn't a bad match. It just was a match that never really got started. Intentionally, I think. Yeah. It, it definitely seems to be a match that, instead of the build building the match, it was the match building the aftermath. Yeah, because the aftermath was really solid. Um, Goldust and Dusty were talking backstage, and then Stardust comes, comes up, uh, beats up Goldust, and delivers this white-hot, amazing promo. Best promo of the match. Best promo I've heard in a couple months out of the WWE. It was actually really good. Listener, uh, listener who isn't Billy, since Billy is now a talker. Um, I'm an ascended extra. There you go. Uh... I would suggest you look up this, if you have the network, look up this promo, maybe find it on YouTube if you don't, although if you don't, I don't know why. Um, because it's, that promo from Stardust is really, really solid work. Um, but nothing else much happens in that match besides the promo that came after it. Um, the next match is Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. Versus the Usos for the tag team titles that the Usos have had surgically grafted onto their waists for 11 years. Um, <laughs> years? I, I didn't think they'd been wrestling that long. Uh, no, you see, the stupid penny belts came with them into the WWE. Uh. <laughs> but it was, a, uh, it was a good match, I thought. Oh yeah, definitely a very good match. The Tyson and Cesaro has been a better gel than I would have expected. Yeah, they work really well together as like the power and speed archetype for wrestling. But since they're since Tyson Kidd's surprisingly strong for someone so tiny, and since uh, Antonio Cesaro isn't actually all that big, despite being freakishly strong, it's. It works really well because they can maintain all they can maintain a lot of speed and activity in the ring, while at the same time being. Um, sorry, the heater just kicked on. That's going to be some noise. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. See, this is our our sidekick, the heater. Ah, uh, yes, our. You uh, have the no idea nerd. how to sell things. There you go. Positive reinforcement for the listener. Um, but, ugh, completely lost my train of thought. Um, but basically this was just a really good match to solidify Cesaro and Kid, and I think it's, I think it was important for both of them. This, I thought this, um, really was great for Kid because he was part of the main roster for years. They got down, downgraded, side grade, whatever, to NXT, and then he, like, got a resurgence onto the main roster. Yeah, and he was, Ducky was always good. I mean, oh, yeah. it's just, he didn't really gel well with the whole heart gimmick that he had before, and he didn't gel well with, I am I think it was like Bulldog's Kid? Yeah, it was Bulldog's Kid. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, they had kind of the same, the same overall gimmick as him and Cesaro do, strong guy, fast guy, but it's just, they didn't have much chemistry. Whereas, Really? Um, that's that's kind of surprising because they were they teamed all over the indies. I you know what maybe they were really maybe it was just the WWE style that got in their way. I understand the same thing happened with like uh, London and Kendrick. The WWE style got in their way, so they never really they never really entertained me all that much because they couldn't do what they were actually good at. Maybe it was the same situation. That um, might be because I know I've watched some interviews with. Uh, uh, Smith after he left and he complained about the tag team style in WWE where there's an unwritten rule you can only break up a pinfall like once and then it's a DQ. And so that, that like hindered them? Yeah, that's weird. I, 
I don't even know that I've like I don't see that in matches that rule being followed. That's that's a weird rule to even try to follow. That very much stilts your match flow. Yeah, um, and that that's what he was saying. Like even if you're gonna have that rule, you need to mention it so that way there's you know a build like oh crap they already broke that pinfall they can't do it again. So now everything it ups the stakes. Yeah, that'd be a good rule to mention out loud. Yeah. But, um. Uh, yeah, no, it's that's weird. Uh, and maybe it was more stuff like that, because I understand the E has a very rigid style, um, so they, yeah. not everybody adapts to it well. Um, but for whatever reason, these guys these guys definitely have, and they've, they've gelled together really well. Um, the Usos were as good as they always are. Um, I feel bad, because I'm always kind of shitting on the Usos, and they're not a bad tag team. They're just not a great tag team. But at the same time, they're like the one consistent tag team that the WWE has built, so they can't really throw them out of the, the title picture for a while. Yeah, no, the Usos always kind of have to be in the title picture because they're the best, most solid tag team they have. Who's the most built and the most established? But if they're just not, they don't, they put on really quality matches, but their gimmick is kind of thin, and they're not good at cutting promos. And yeah. so there's only so much they can do to entertain you. They're good mechanics. They're really good mechanics, but outside of the match itself, there's not a lot there, at least as far as my experience has shown. The only promos I've ever heard them cut have been pretty objectively fucking awful. Um, I, I, think it, I think it might not be quite as noticeable if, if the WWE were doing actual fucking builds for tag title matches. Like, the only legitimate segment I've ever seen in the last year was when uh, the Dust Brothers, as you call them, uh, turned and, like, viciously fucking attacked the Usos. That was the only actual build other than, oh, we're going to have these two teams meet 70 fucking yeah. times in the build to their title match. Yeah, you're right. I mean, like, a lot of their tag team build is mostly just, I'm going to put these two dudes in a room and slam them together a thousand times. It's like, it's like you gave a, a fucking seven-year-old a set of WWE action figures, so they're not all that creative. Uh, maybe they're like a boring seven-year-old, so all they really do is is have the little figures slam into each other for a while, and then one guy pins the other, and then they do it again. And... Yeah. You're right, that really does hinder things. Maybe the Usos would be better if you gave them some more, like, non-promo-based storylines. Like, um, when the, when the Dust Brothers fucking flipped out and attacked them, there was a good couple weeks there where they managed, where the Usos managed to sell being really, really angry about it. Yeah, and it's like, there, there's no reason for them to be wrestling in a match if it's not the titles. Because... Although they're, they're, they're kind of doing something after this, where Natalia and Naomi get into it as well. Super. Uh, it'll probably lead to, I'm going to be honest, it'll probably lead to a six-man intergender tag match at Mania, which is going to be your piss brick match. Um, <laughs> but, whatever. Uh, look, Card needs a piss brick match. Um, they do. And it'd be really sad if the tag team titles weren't at least on the card. Um, oh, uh, did I even cover who won? No, no, uh, we didn't. No, you didn't? Yeah, no, uh, Tyson Kidd ends up doing, like, a fucking <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous, uh, roll-up pin, I think. No, it was an actual move, um, but I forget the name of it, something, it's something long and, compl and complicated to, to mention, but it's, uh, they won, they won clean, which I was surprised by, to be honest. Because they're a pretty heel tag team, but they won clean. It looked really good. It looked it established them as really good as a really good tag team, and established them as able to compete on the same plane as the Usos, who you've set as your top plane for tag teams. So, I mean, overall, the match did what it needed to do. Um, I don't know that they have the uh, Usos get the title back at Mania. I mean, part of me says they do for the big face win at Mania, which is what you want. Part of me says they don't because those Tyson Kidd and Cesaro could have a really solid run as a heel tag as the heel tag team champions, 
they could have a really solid run there, and I don't know that that's not a better idea. So it'll probably be the Usos because I can never trust the WWE to do the good idea. Yeah, and it's it's difficult because uh, jumping ahead to Rusev versus Cena, they're setting that up as a rematch as well, and in both instances, not to spoil anything with her, but both the heel sides win. It, and it's mania. You have to have kind of a back and forth between yay face one, yay or boo heel one. And so I can't imagine they're going to do both heels winning. Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, I do want to cover the uh, the Rusev Cena match in detail, but I- I'll mention this right now. I'm fucking ninety nine percent sure Rusev's losing in Mania. Um, oh, that couldn't be a worse decision. Right? But, I mean, he's got to lose eventually. I have We have to see if his gimmick can stand losing. Um, we know Cena's gimmick can withstand losing. The guy's fucking made of adamantium. But um, I need, we have to know if Rusev's gimmick can withstand losing. So he has to lose eventually. Uh, Cena is going to be the guy that's two at this point. I would prefer pretty much anybody else on the roster, except maybe Heath Slater, but... It's... Well, I think it, it could... He can withstand the loss if they immediately put him back into the undefeated mode. If, like, it looked like a one-time fluke. Yeah, like, you have him lose, and then he doesn't, doesn't fucking change the gimmick at all. He still breaks motherfuckers like Ivan Drago. That yeah. that would be the best way to go about it. I don't know that that's what they'll do. I'm just hoping they don't make him into a fucking joke like Vladimir Kozlov. Um, and, and Rusev's in a very interesting position, I think, because if they continue maintaining him, because Lesnar's probably on his way out, because he's wanting to do UFC again, I think. Well, yeah, he fucking but, walked out on a Raw, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's on his way out, man. Yeah, but Rusev could become that next Lesnar that he's so fucking difficult to beat if they could just maintain his not losing. Yeah, if they just... You know what? He doesn't even necessarily need to remain undefeated. It just needs to look... Just don't have him fucking getting beat by Kofi Kingston. Like, as much as I love Kofi, you don't want that. You want him... Like, John Cena? John Cena can beat Rusev. John Cena can beat anyone. John Cena's Superman. But, like, can Jack Swagger beat Rusev? Still no. Make it so that's still a no for Jack Swagger beating Rusev. Can The Miz beat Rusev? No. Can The Rock beat Rusev? Yes. That's You need to keep him up as like an upper card level talent where he's good enough that the lower card isn't really going to beat him. But, but he could also still be in that role where an up and cover can beat him and that brings them into the main event. Yeah, where he's... Uh, jobber to the stars is a term. I don't really want him in that position. That's where Dolph Ziggler lives. Dolph Ziggler has an apartment there. I don't want to kick the guy out. Um, <laughs> but that sort of thing. Your upper mid-card, high-end talent who exists to help... Who exists to both help showcase your main event talent, uh, maybe becomes your main event talent in a couple of years, and really what I would have loved to have seen them do with Roman Reigns. Um... For give him a couple years work as like upper mid card before rocketing up to to the main event. Um, yeah, but they didn't have much other choices. No, they ran out of Reigns. They year. ran out when they when they pushed when they decided to push Reigns. They were out of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and that's why I've had you know various discussions with Skell for the listener. He's my version of White or the Boy, whichever is more offensive. He's <laughs> <laughs> like he, he was. So adamant, Reigns should not have won the Rumble, but there were no other choices. Bray doesn't make any sense. Cesaro isn't ready. Um, Brian's already a made guy. He doesn't need the win over Brock, the title, the Rumble win, etc. And I understand Dolph is kind of used as the mid card, but he's he's a made man in that they could have just said, okay, Lesnar versus Ziggler at Fastlane for the title. Nobody would have blinked an eye. The crowd would have been just fine with it. Yeah, that's that's a good point, is people always talk about how Dolph Ziggler doesn't get pushed enough. It's not that he doesn't get pushed, it's that at this point in his career, he's been around long enough, he doesn't need pushed. The fans buy him. They buy him, they like him. If they want him in the main event, they can just put him in the main event, and nobody's going to blink an eye. Yeah. Aside from the few people uh, who just absolutely fucking hate him. 
because there is a small but violent contingent who hates the <laughs> shit out of Dolph Ziggler. They still remember the Spirit Squad. <laughs> They'll never shall they forget. Um, uh, the Intercontinental Championship match was the was the match after the tag team match. Um, it ended in DQ. Uh, Wait, whoa, 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 whoa! No, the 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 Divas match came after the Piss Make Break match came after. Did it? I thought it came after the Intercontinental match before the US title. No. Unless Wikipedia is lying to me. Oh well, fuck it. Let's cover the Divas match. Uh, it was only five minutes long. It's not like it's going to take very long. Um, Nikki Bella beat Paige, and she, and then Paige was upset because Nikki Bella pulled her tights. Uh, they showcased a new camera, wherein there's a camera in the turnbuckle, so you got to see Paige's face hit it. That was pretty cool. And mm-hmm. literally, that's the only fucking thing that happened in the match, because it was five minutes long. Yeah, I, that's pretty much it. But this, this is where we diverge. You absolutely hate the Bellas, and I'm <coughs> coughing. I'm... <laughs> I'm all right with him. You're all right with the Bellas? You think that's... Like, because they're not very good wrestling-wise? I don't know. They're, they're average. I mean, they're not they're not Paige. But I think they do their job well enough. They're better than a lot of the shit we've been given, I think, in the Divas Division. That's true. They're better than Alicia Fox. I don't like the Bellas. I fucking hate <laughs> Alicia Fox. Alicia Fox is gonna kill somebody one day. She is dangerous. I wouldn't get into a ring with her. And I don't know shit about wrestling, okay? <laughs> you um, just wanna get in there with an interview with her. She might botch it that badly that your head falls off. Right? I'm not. It's too dangerous, man. I'm scared. Um. But, but, but. She has the best fucking Northern Light suplex I've ever seen. Really? I haven't I noticed. So. I she, don't... She, she bridges it very well, I think. I I haven't noticed. I think I'm just always so fucking terrified for her for her <laughs> person she's working with's life that I just I never notice when she does something good because it's more like oh she didn't kill them. Well, that's as good as I could really expect. She um, has a couple of interesting moves. I mean, the, the ass kick looks like she's not concerned at all for somebody's whole being. And that, it's it's that fucking backbreaker, man. That backbreaker and her old finisher with with the flip, where she like, if she doesn't get enough clearance, she's gonna straight snap their neck on the on the mat when they when they go over. Those those moves of hers, they fucking scare me, man. But um, anyway, the match that actually happened. Um, I'm not. You know what? I don't like the Bells very much, but I think they could win me over if they got more than thirty five seconds to wrestle. Yeah, and see, I, I don't know what it is about them, but they, they're, like, Nikki had one of her promos last fall against AJ. She had it cut down because it was not, like, this really scathing fucking promo against AJ and some of her hypocritical statements towards the Divas. But they had to cut it down because it was a little too close to home or, you know, too truthful for somebody that wanting his baby face. Yeah, I, fair. <laughs> I, so it was like, if she had been able to do that, she would have been a, a fantastic heel more than just, ooh, look at me, I'm pretty. It, it would have been, yeah, it, I'm not taking shit from the faces. They, I mean, they could really use, with, honestly, the entire Divas division, the entire WWE Divas division, could use a reclassification to female wrestlers. Um, they could use more time. More than anything else, they could use more time. You have three fucking hours to fill. Give the Divas a ten minute match, for fuck's sake. Um, it's not gonna kill you. I don't know what the deal is with what? the... If it's, if it's Alicia Fox, it might kill somebody. Well, that's <laughs> fair. Maybe don't get, maybe limit her time in the ring. Tell you what, make her like, make her the official Divas match announcer. That way, she can be in and she can you know, do her promos because she cuts a decent promo. Um, and that way, she can be in the ring and be a ta- and you know be entertaining without being responsible for someone else's he- self, you know, safety and well-being. Um, but yeah, give them give them ten minute matches. You have three fucking hours to fill. You can spare ten minutes for a diva's match. Um, but the, and again, depending on the diva, a yeah. page I could do ten minutes easily. Paige versus Natalia were ten minutes. That would be 
pretty amazing match. Cage versus Natalya, 10 minutes. Give them, I mean, I understand your pay-per-view cards are usually pretty stacked. You need the time for various other matches. But maybe cut out, as much as I love him, from this year's WrestleMania, maybe cut out, like, the Snoop Dogg cameo and give the Divas another another 10 minutes or so. It's just, it's not difficult to make room for them. And if you watch, I, I hate to keep mentioning it, but it fucking keeps being appropriate. If you watch NXT, uh, fucking, if you give them time, they do really good matches. Charlotte Flair is, like, not great on the mic from what I've seen, but she is really good in, in ring, along with, like, Bailey and uh, Becky Lynch, I think is her name. Uh, pretty much all the ones in that super card on um, the NXT TakeOver I watched last, they're really talented, and they give them match-length spots, and they do well with them. I I don't know why the actual main roster WWE bookers, why the writers, are so scared of giving female wrestlers more than 35 seconds to fucking wrestle in. If I had to guess it, it's from a period when they just weren't good enough to get more time, and they're they're just unwilling to pull the trigger to give them more. Yeah, because for a while they were really fucking awful. In the middle of the whole diva search thing, they were yeah. they were real bad. And I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe it's just because the E is usually very slow to move on stuff like that. Because it's an it's and if it ain't broke, don't fix it mindset. Yeah. But in this case, I think it might be broke. Um, <laughs> well, and, and I think part of the problem is they're using they or they have they've used the the divas matches to hype total divas, not the other way around. Yeah, I, they do mention fucking total divas a lot. All right, a full disclosure, uh, Vince Paul, if you're at Ultimo Dragon's house. Um, I'm not going to fucking watch Total Divas. That's not going to happen. I understand you're trying to market to every human being on Earth, and that Total Divas is for a different segment of human beings than me, but I'm not watching it. So I don't care about it, and when you mention it during the match, that makes me care about the match less. Yeah, and it's just, they could bring that audience of Total Divas over to the main bread and butter, but they're, they're doing it backwards. They're trying to bring the main bread and butter audience to Total Divas, and that's yeah. why, I think, is my ultimate question. Why? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I could bitch that female wrestlers aren't getting enough uh, recognition or time for, like, the next four hours. Um, but... Did well, you, you know what? I got the time. <laughs> Did you have any other thoughts about the Divas match? Like, any positive thoughts for what match there was? No, not really. Yeah, Cage was the star as usual. Yeah, that's, I mean, not, that's, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, Intercontinental Championship match. Yes. I don't fucking, like, alright, it's been two weeks, this is, one of the things I mentioned is I might forget, I don't remember shit about this match. I remember the finish. <laughs> I don't remember anything else. And and that's something I've been considering recently with Dean Ambrose. Now, I'm a fan of Ambrose, as I'm assuming you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I have... Do you, do you ever get the feel... Like, like, a constant feeling after his matches? Like, not that they were bad, not that they were disappointing, not that they didn't fulfill what they were supposed to fulfill, but don't you ever feel like they weren't... Everything they could have been for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I get that. I got that a lot with the the match he had last pay per view. I forget uh, the and the whole Bray Wyatt gimmick, really. Um, yeah, the match he had last pay per view with Bray Wyatt, where he killed himself with the television. Um, I I've been getting that a lot recently from from Dean Ambrose. I think it's I think it's that he really fucking hates the WWE way of doing things. So. Because it's not, it doesn't really fit with the kind of wrestler he is. Like, he's a 90s wrestler. He's a 90s Attitude Era wrestler. And the PG era just doesn't fit with him. So there's this air of, the match isn't everything it could be. Because if he was just a little bit less tethered, if he had a little bit of more freedom they had in the, they had in the Attitude Era, he'd be able to do 
so much more wacky bullshit that would let the match get to where it should be. Yeah, but I also didn't feel it, like, during the S.H.I.E.L.D. era, you know? I felt his matches were exactly what they were supposed to be. I don't... I mean, maybe it was because he was playing a different character then. Yeah, and maybe. So the tethering wasn't hurtful. I also, it was probably that he was doing a third of the work. Like, he had Rollins and Reigns to buoy him up in the same way Reigns had Ambrose and Rollins, and, and all three of those guys were able to look better together than they do separately. Well, even in his, his solo United States title matches, what, I, I just all never got that feeling. <laughs> I, I just... I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really seeing... I, don't really, I didn't really notice that back in the day. But that's because I really loved him on, I mean, and probably it's because I really loved him on the mic back in the day. And my personal poop shoot for the Shield was Seth Rollins until he, until they let him, until they let him start wrestling and I realized how good he was. He was the one who always disappointed me. So I guess, like, the disappointment of the match would inherently be brought down on Seth Rollins' soldiers and I wouldn't blame Ambrose. Um, but I, I never really noticed I don't really notice a difference in quality from Ambrose's matches from the Shield era to now, I, any more so than just that he's having to hold up more than match himself now. And it's not that he can't; he can, but the gap, the places he tries to fill in the gaps, could be better. You're right. I mean, in the end, you're right. Whatever, whatever's wrong. I have my theories on what's wrong, but whatever's wrong, the matches could be better for whatever reason. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't want to say he's not good. I no, mean, he's I think great. he's definitely going to be the main event at some point. You know, I could easily see him and Rollins in the main event of a WrestleMania. I just. You know what I he reminds know. me of? Mid 2000s Randy Orton. He's much better on the mic, but Randy Orton's matches were always perfectly fucking serviceable, and they had potential, but there was something missing there. And that was, you know, before I got tired of him, and before, after that, he became really good, uh, mid-2000s Randy Orton had the same sort of vibe for me, where this could have been really amazing, and it was only good. Why? Yeah. It, it, uh, I, it, it bothers me, because I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. I, you know what? I have theories, but even then, neither can I. Um... So I guess just move on to the next match? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we could talk about the ending, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Dean Ambrose gets himself disqualified in the end because he, he has still five and he keeps beating up uh, Bray, uh, Bray Wyatt. No, that's, uh, that's <laughs> last month. Uh, he keeps beating up Barrett after the five count because Barrett had been uh, Barrett had spent the whole match running from him, essentially, trying to leave the match, trying to get out. As soon as things turned against him, Bad News Barrett was like, you know what, fuck this, I'm leaving. Um, and then at the end, Ambrose beats him up after the DQ and steals the title belt and leaves, which I thought was, I love seeing that shit. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what I absolutely loved about Barrett and Ambrose. They actually fucking built to an intercontinental title match for a change. Yeah, um, like what, going up to lead up to the pay-per-view, or are you talking about the, the pay-per-view itself? Uh, the build-up to it, you know, with Ambrose coming out and saying, I want a title match. We, when was the last time you actually saw anybody actually just come out to the ring and say, I want a fucking title match? This, this title huh. means something to me. I want this shot. You know what? I can't... Aside from the world title, I, I can't really think of anything. Like, I'm Damn sure it straight. hasn't been all that long, but it just fucking has been long enough that the fairy dust has settled in and I can't remember. Yeah. Um, it, it's like they reserve storytelling only for, like, the last two matches of a card. Yeah, um, I saw, actually, they did a little video package, I'm remembering it now, on the build-up where, um, Dean Ambrose locked, uh, zip-tied Bray Wyatt, uh, I keep doing that, uh, zip-tied Barrett's hands to the turnbuckle and forced him to sign the match contract, and... Yeah, no, I remember that. I remember thinking at the time that was a weird amount of build-up, but, um, I suppose in the fact that it existed at all, it yeah. Weird. It goes back to the tag title match where the most interesting part of the tag titles in last year were when the Dust Brothers attacked the Usos. It was actual build, not just these two are going to fight at the pay-per-view, let's watch them fight a few dozen times in the build. There was an actual feud happening. 
Yeah. Um, you're right. I mean, I can't remember the last time somebody just fucking straight up asked for a title match and then went about getting it. That's that's a good build. And this match is also a really good build to another match at, at Mania. Um, but here's here's the oddity to that. They're not building to, to straight up Barrett versus Ambrose. They're not? Interesting. No, what are they building to? It, it, a multi-person ladder match. Um, let's see here. Just as a recap, um, let's see. Here. Ziggler beat Barrett, so he's he. Not until this week did he actually make a claim towards it. But our truth came out, and like he stole the Intercontinental title belt, and then gave, and then it, gave back it back to Ambrose. to Ambrose. Yeah, I saw that in week in review. And then this week, our truth was announced to be in the ladder match, and so he stole the title again during a match, and then Luke Harper intimidated him into giving it to Harper, and then Harper walked off with it. Um, I mean, okay, this is, that's, <laughs> that, that might be a really good match. Um, let's see. It's an odd, it's an odd build, but at least there's some sort of build for it. It is an interesting build, it's certainly a very interesting story, and then you got, um... Bad News Barrett, R-Truth, Luke Harper, Dolph Ziggler, and Dean Ambrose. Uh, Ambrose? Dean Ambrose? That's that's a good ladder match. That that could end up looking really cool. Um, I'm yeah. excited for that, actually. And, and I just love Barrett getting so fucking pissed that people keep taking his fucking title. Every I mean, time he gets it back, somebody else takes it. I love uh, that's 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 a good heel gimmick right there. Cause you know what? If it weren't, if he weren't such a prick about it, yeah, that's perfectly understandable. I'd get mad too. <laughs> um. So at this point, we're at the U.S. title match. Yes. Um, the John Cena versus Rusev match, which was a good fucking match. Yes. Just a good fucking match. Um. It was solid. Up until the very end, it was back and forth, and you didn't know who was going to win. They told a really solid story of, you know, Cena being super cocky that he's going to beat Rusev and getting real fucking, getting some real surprises partway through the match. Um, the announcers were really selling the Cena's getting old thing, which is weird, but certainly not unwelcome, because it means that they might be transitioning Cena into a, into a less prominent role. Which would be welcome, because I love John Cena. Um, I am still a Cena apologist, but at the end of the day, I'm tired of fucking seeing him in the world title scene. Well, that's, that's something very interesting I think about this match. It's very old-school booking all across the board. I mean, it, for whatever reason, it brings me to mind to NWA, where a world champion might be, or a world champion caliber guy might fight for the U.S. title against an upper cover to put them over. Yeah, and this has really been, uh, this has been so far a really good way of putting Rusev over. And uh, I can't decide whether putting John Cena back in the U.S. title scene makes the U.S. title look good or makes John Cena look bad. Um, I think it makes the U.S. title look good, but that's my opinion. No, I mean, that's a perfectly valid opinion. Um, I think it will have to do with how the finish is done at Mania. Like I said, I'm, I'm almost certain Cena's winning. But... Mm. I, I would just hate that. I, I think it would, it's the last vestige that Rusev I, I needs to just solidify him. He will be main event. I mean, right now it's kind of one big loss and he could be lost in the shuffle or he could be, okay, a good solid win over Cena again and he's guaranteed he's going to take the Lesnar's monster spot. I mean, you're right. Um, let me put it this way. I love Rusev. Up until this most recent match, he was the best booked face in the company. Um, he was only getting boost because he was from Russia. He overcame odds. He overcame adversity. He was getting he was getting double teamed by giant heel wrestlers who beat him up solely because of his country of origin. He was a monster face. Like he was an amazingly booked, perfectly booked face. He finally cheated to beat John Cena in this most recent match. Um, Another old-school tactic. Yeah, very old-school tactic. The manager gets tactic. involved, he goes low blow, win. Yep. And um, I just, it was really, really solid. And Rusev has been booked really solid. And I love Rusev. I would love for him to win. 
If he wins at Mania, I will get I will jump the fuck out of my chair. That is not a joke. But I don't think it happens. I do not think he walks out of Mania a winner. As much as I would love it, I just don't see it. It's it's just difficult to tell when it's against Cena. You never know when Cena's going to win or when Cena's going to lose. No, you do. You do. You watch. <laughs> you fucking watch. I don't know. I was I was almost certain Cena was going to go over no. in some manner I at mean, Fastlane. I was worried. Don't get me wrong. I was worried. But he didn't fucking wink. I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before. If Cena comes out to the ring and when he does that moment when he fucking catches the camera and looks directly dead down the lens before he does his little, before the thing screams Sabanasaur like Raiden and it, uh, he does the little okay motion, um, he looks dead into the camera. If he winks at that moment, he's winning. I fucking, I've seen it over the course of this entire year, um, cause I didn't watch a lot of pay-per-views before that, but every fucking pay-per-view I've watched, he's winked at that exact moment in, all, I believe, every match he's won. I'm not entirely surprised about that. I've, I've heard something about Jericho, actually, years ago. You could tell if he was going to win or lose by whether or not he was smiling. Yeah, um, I mean, it would be a great way for them to swerve me is if Cena, like, does a really obvious wink and then loses. I'd be real stunned. That'd be a real easy <laughs> swerve for you to do. Um, but I, so far, at least as far as I've been able to tell, that pattern is fucking unbroken. Um, I've never noticed it. I, I don't look Cena in the eye. <laughs> I, if that's what you're into, I'm not judging. Uh, in this particular case, yeah, I'm very interested into what's going on there. Um, but, I mean, other than that, the, the match was really good, but I don't know that it bears a lot more comment. I think there'll be more comment to be made after Mania to see where this gimmick ends up. Yeah. Um, I think that'll help, that, that the, the fallout from it will be more interesting than this, what was obviously a, a on the road to match. Yeah, like uh, Goldust vs. Stardust earlier. Yep, exactly. Um, so that brings us Which to the main event, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, oh, yeah, no, we, we covered who won. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I keep forgetting to fucking do that. Uh, but oh, the boy, you are just not white. I'm just not. I lack that, <laughs> that je ne sais quoi. Um, but main title, uh, the WWE winner gets the, the title shot at Mania match between Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan. This was a fucking barn burner. This was... Um, this was the match Roman Reigns needed to have to prove he could be in WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, fucking Daniel Bryan carried the match. He was the MVP of that match. He made Roman look real fucking strong to pull a joke from CM Punk's podcast. <laughs> um, but, but Bryan made himself look strong, too, because he got to be that expert technical wrestler just taking somebody apart. He, he didn't have to be the underdog. Yeah, no, he, was, he wasn't sold as the underdog in this match. And I like that. I, I like that you brought that up because that's very important. He was sold as perfectly equal for very different reasons. As he put oh, yeah. in the build-up, you're bigger and you're stronger, but I'm better. Mm-hmm. Um, and they sold that throughout the whole match. Daniel Bryan would out-wrestle Roman, and then Roman would use his mighty, mighty God strength to power out of it anyway. Um... But yeah, this was this was the match Roman Reigns needed to have to prove he he was main event class. Yeah. Um, and and I, I've been watching since, like especially the Rumble, like getting booed out of fucking Philly or Pittsburgh or wherever we were this year. He, he's had like a chip on his shoulder to get better in the ring. Because I mean that was a criticism that had been labeled that had been lobbed his way a couple times. By a lot of like very important people, Stone Cold said it, Jr. said it, that he'll work the work wasn't quite there yet. He had potential, and he was going to be a main eventer, but the ring work wasn't there yet. His work rate wasn't there yet. Um, and and I, I just think if he hadn't gotten that hernia last year, he would have he would have been more or less ready by Rumble time, so that he wouldn't have gotten. Booed as badly. As yeah, well, because I mean that that it totally sucked the wind out of his sails. He was yeah. fucking. He was hot. He wasn't Daniel Bryan hot, but he was hot. 
before yeah, we got it, that. It was one of those, if you didn't see Reigns was going to Mania this year, you weren't paying attention. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty, he was fucking, and that's, I think that was part of the problem, that's part of the reason the fans got angry, is because if you didn't see he was going to Mania, you weren't paying attention. It was yeah. real obvious. He was the anointed one. He was the the chosen son come to take the place of our fallen lord of Krypton. He is the new John Cena. And I'm fine with that because, one, he's not John Cena. Um, and two, he is a fucking talented young guy. Well, the, the problem, as long as we're on Cena comparisons, is that he very much has the ability to become the next John Cena in being just Superman. And that's that's part of the reason why people have turned on Cena, I think. Yeah, I mean, just, he literally has a move with the word Superman in it. Uh, you don't get much more blatant than that. Yeah, well, it's just... And part of this is WWE, like, doesn't understand what the everyman is. They look at Cena with the clean shaven and the big muscles, and here, he's the everyman. He's representing you, and... They're baffled when people are behind Daniel Bryan, who's smaller and is an actual fucking underdog. Yeah, it's... I'd, I'd rather they... If that's, their, if that's their thought process, I actually am kind of complimented. They, they think that I am more closely represented by this giant, hulking, lantern-jawed behemoth man that is John Cena. Because, no, I don't fucking look like that, Vince. Um, that does not represent me, nor the everyman. The everyman is not a titan. But, um, I'm glad you think so. I think you've spent too many years among wrestlers, where 6'5 is the average height. Right, and, and that goes back to the era of Hogan, where he could be seen as the everyman, in so far as people still believed wrestling was legit. And so, you know, we could see him get ganked up on people and go, oh shit, I don't know if he can come back from this, as opposed to now when we're in on the joke, as it were, and we know Cena is going to make it. Yeah, we know Cena's just going to be just fine. Just, he's going to be yeah. just fine. Um, and where Cena takes, you know, a beating and is completely knocked unconscious and he has his back stretched to the limits and comes out smiling and laughing the next week on Raw. <laughs> Where he gets the worst beating of his entire life, gets suplexed literally 16 fucking times, takes a week off, and comes back stronger than ever. <laughs> he's like a, he's a fucking super saiyan is what he is. But um, I think Roman Reigns has a lot of that potential. He could get booked into being too ridiculously unstoppable. But I think where they're going the right way in the beginning you know, right now with, with Roman and where they, where I think Roman has something that Cena doesn't have. Cena is an amazing, is, is a pretty, I mean, his work rate isn't the best. His moves, he has a limited move set by choice. But Cena doesn't sell all that well. He never has. He can sell the shit out of a move, but he doesn't sell a match well. He doesn't sell being damaged well. Roman Reigns does that a little better. Like, when you see him get his ass beaten in by the authority, he looks like he's legitimately fucking unconscious. And he's been working on that. They've, like, I've noticed each match since Mania, he's been getting better at it. He uh, he was a little off in that first match with Sho. He, like, Sho worked on his leg, and then Reigns went into his juggernaut run over everything and forgot to sell it or something. And then Miz forced him to sell better and better, and I think the, the caveat, well, if I'm using that word correctly, was this match where Brian, where he did well with selling a hernia. How many fucking wrestlers can you think of that have ever had to sell a hernia? Yeah, that have ever had to sell, like, a spleen injury. <laughs> and he fucking, he sold the shit out of that spleen injury, man. I bought that. I bought that his fucking stomach hurt like hell. And I imagine that's because he's actually fucking had it. So he could do it. He knew exactly where to grab, how to, oh, fuck, this hurts, and sell it. Yeah, he knew how to sell a, a stomach in pain, because he's very intimately familiar with it. <laughs> um, uh, in the end, uh, Reigns goes over, which, uh, you know what? 
there came a moment when I knew Reigns was going over, but they had me wondering, they had me wondering in the middle of the match if that was going to be the case. Yeah, there, there was no chance that no. they were going to, I, I just didn't feel that they could do that again. It would have. Yeah, they capitulated to the fans last year. I didn't think they were going to do it again, but. And maybe. they should. The, the fan, fans have the right to say whether they like something or don't like something, but when they have to do a an 11th hour rewrite of going into Mania, the he, fans have a little too much. Right? You know? Uh, it's just, and I think Vince, I think Vince ultimately was probably the one who made the call there because he's probably a little fucking salty about last year. Vince does not like to be told what to do. Yeah. Um, and they, they had to do it last year. There was not another option. But, because fucking Batista was just not getting over. But I think they, I think they trusted Roman in this instance because, um, it was mentioned in the WWE podcast uh, with Stone Cold and uh, Triple H that it house shows when the, when the television audience isn't there so the smarts don't boo to tell Vince that they're mad, Roman Reigns doesn't get boo one. People fucking love him so long as there's not another reason to boo him that isn't related to him. So I think they trusted him more there because he's over. It's just that smarts are fucking loud. And I'm really interested for Mania. I'm a little concerned for Mania because one of the big reasons that's, uh, that Brian Ro- that Brian Reigns match was really good is that Brian is a fucking excellent ring general. Mm-hmm. He can run a match like nobody's business. He's a fucking talented veteran. He has many years of experience, and he knows match psychology really well, so he can make a match look good. Uh, like Triple H. Uh, many people have said Triple H could get a good match out of a fucking broom, and I believe it. Uh, but... And, really? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Triple H is an amazing ring general. Like, he's in his twilight years, he's not a full-time talent anymore, but there's a reason he's still active on the roster occasionally. He can get a good match out of fucking anything. I'll admit he's, he's good, I, I just don't know that he's quite as good as you're giving him. I think that's actually, I think that's actually to his credit, because in a lot of his matches, they're good because he's really good at making his opponent look amazing. Without selling, without doing the Evan Bourne thing and just making everything they do look like it looks like it has a million megatons of force, he's good at making his opponent look legit. Um, I'm actually a really big Triple H fan, but I, and Daniel Bryan's the same way. Daniel Bryan could probably get a good match out of a fucking mop. No, I can believe that. <laughs> um, but Brock Lesnar's not that guy. Brock Lesnar's an amazing cheat code of a human being. He's a fucking par excellence athlete. He's not a ring general. He never has been. No. It's just not how it works. I mean, he's a great fighter, as evidenced by the fact that he could legitimately murder most of the human beings on the planet with nothing but his fists um, and giant meat muscles. But he's not a ring general. He doesn't, he's not a great match psychologist. And Roman Reigns is still pretty green. So I don't know that he could call that match either. And fucking Paul can't do it, because Paul's over at the side of the ring. So there's no general in that match. There's no one to run the match. The only way that match is going to be good is if those guys fucking practice. If they work together, they get some training time in, and they work on that match to make it good. It could be good. But since you don't have anyone available to call shit on the fly, to call audibles when need be, that match is fucking scary to me because it might be awful. Yeah, I, I think that they're going to have to focus more on the story of the match than the wrestling of the match. You know, have Reigns rape Reigns, or Lesnar rape Reigns in the middle of the ring, and Reigns just keeps coming back. Yeah, focusing on the story of the match is probably the best thing they're gonna. It's probably the best they're gonna be able to do because it's not. Look, it's just not gonna be a fucking clinic. It's not gonna be a uh, you know a, a twenty five thirty minute long clinic. It might be twenty five thirty minutes long, but it's gonna be a story match more than a technical showcase. Uh, if for no other reason, that's just not what either of those guys do. Mm-hmm. I'm interested for it. I'm very excited for it. I. I'm also scared for it, because it might suck. 
it could very easily suck. Um, and not for nothing, those are two talented guys. It's just neither one of them is the kind of veteran you want in the main event of Mania to call a match. Um, I think it's probably one of the reasons they inserted a... You know, that's one of the reasons they, they like to go with triple threats when they're concerned about you know either one of the talents not really having that ability. They'll throw in a more senior talent to help run things. But... I don't. I don't want that to be the case here. I'd like to see. I'd like to see Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar one on one. I think that would be good. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to triple threat this. This. This needs to be Reigns conquering the conqueror. Yeah, and that will that that makes Reigns your guy. That makes him the guy. Yeah. Um. So I mean, we covered the whole fast lane pay per view. Um. Did you have any other? Did you have any other thoughts on the WWE as a whole um, going into WrestleMania? Anything you wanted to cover? Uh, well, it just kind of covers the couple of Raws afterwards, but they're, they seem to be building a lot more singles feuds for a change. Because it, it, it always seemed like there was a couple of big ones, and then there were a lot of little clusterfucks along the Mania card. But it looks like we're going to get, like, Lester Reigns, Sting, Triple H. I mean, we'll have the Intercontinental Ladder clusterfuck, um, and the Andre Memorial Ladder Royal. But we're all—it it looks like we're going to get. Oh, they're doing that uh, again. Yes. Oh, cool. That is confirmed. Um, but it looks like we're getting—we'll get like Goldust versus Stardust. I think they're finally pulling the trigger on Miz Dow versus Miz. There's oh, just a lot yay! Of, there's just a lot of singles feuds that are finally going to be on the card, and I, I don't know, I, I've only watched the last couple of Manias, but I have, since before then, I don't think there's been many cards like that. <clears throat> yeah, no, I can't really, I mean, that sounds like a really stacked card. I'm, I'm glad to hear about it, especially with it being, you know, I have the, I know the network's one year old now, but WrestleMania is really the one year anniversary of the network. Mm-hmm. Um, so, that's a really good way to, to sell things up. They're really they're really pushing the network. Um, so am I. <laughs> you'd think I'd be, you'd think I was getting money from them to be honest. Well, they're not getting money from me. I'm poor. I am sad. Um, but I really very much look forward to WrestleMania, and I look forward to watching WWE Week in Review. Until then. <laughs> Um, well, that's about, I think that's about us, we're, you know, we're at time. Um, normally, White tries for something a little more organic than this, but I'm not White. I did the intro, sir, I believe you know your line? I do not. Oh, (laughs) I'm sad. Everything is better when nerds talk about it, even when I'm not here. You shut up. Fuck it, let's get hardcore!